Good morning, all. We'll wait just a second for people to get into the room. Okay, um, so as people filter in, um, it's uh, first of all, good morning to everyone uh, here in DC. Um, good evening to those in Asia. Um, and thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, I'm Jenny Town. I am a senior fellow at the Stimson Center and director of our Korea program and our 38 North program. Um, we're really excited to roll out a new report we've been working on over the past two years now. Um, it's well known that North Korea has one of the most oppressive information environments in the world and that the regime has been bolstering its controls on society in recent years. Um, our team has been trying to better understand the evolving dynamics created by increased digital, social and information controls in North Korea. Um, and I've made some interesting findings, not only about what is currently in place, um, but also what is being researched and maybe possible in the future if challenges like consistent energy provision can be overcome. Um, the report was published this morning, uh, just a minute or two ago, um, on 38 North and the Stimson's on our website. And for those of you joining via Zoom, um, we'll drop a link in the chat for you. Um, but to tell us more about the research and findings, I'm pleased to introduce my team members here at 38 North who led this research. Martin Williams is a senior fellow with 38 North. He focuses primarily on North Korea's technology, infrastructure, broadcasting systems, and propaganda. Um, he runs the North Korea Tech blog and is one of the leading experts on North Korea's information environment. Um, he was previously a journalist for the technology newswire IDG News Service um, and served as a night journalism fellow at Stanford University. Uh, Natalia Slavny, is a research analyst with 38 North and our assistant editor. Um, her research experience and interests include North Korea's socioeconomic development, as well as international law, human rights, inter-Korean relations, and USDPRK relations. Um, both Martin and Natalia are members of the National Committee on North Korea and non-resident fellows at the European Center for North Korean Studies at the University of Vienna. Um, so before we get started, I would like to just remind everyone, if you have questions at any time, please feel free to add them to the Q&A box, um, and we will definitely get to them after some opening remarks um, to tell us more about the report. Uh, and with that, I will turn it over to you, Martin. Oh, Martin, you are, yeah. Yeah, thanks, Jenny. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, are the, I'm going to give a very brief introduction to, to the report and why we decided to look into this. Uh, and then uh, Natalia is going to talk a little bit about how we did it. Then we're going to go into some of the findings as well. Um, so we started this uh, we started this work with a sort of basic premise, which was that, you know, as Jenny said, North Korea um, has one of the, the largest surveillance, uh, human surveillance systems in the world. And it gets all of its technology across the border from China. And China has gone very big in on digital surveillance in the last sort of uh, five to 10 years. So is North Korea adopting all of that digital technology? Is it pulling that Chinese system in to supplement the human uh, level surveillance system that North Korea is doing? Uh, so that's the, um, that's the report that we, uh, that we launched uh, today. And it's on the website. Um, North Korea has historically had much greater control of its population. Um, so uh, we, we thought that this was uh, this was something that we needed to, uh, first of all, talk to some North Koreans about. Um, we also uh, looked at a lot of sources. Natalia is going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, so Natalia, if you can uh, take it away. Great. Thanks, Martin. So our report is based on pretty extensive research carried out over the last couple of years, as Jenny mentioned drawing on a combination of open source study, including North Korean media and academic journals, satellite imagery analysis, an advisory group of technology experts, some semi-structured interviews we conducted in South Korea, and a survey of in-country residents regarding digital surveillance technology and information controls in North Korea. 
So we spent most of the first year of this project cataloging and analyzing a broad range of North Korean media publications and academic journals regarding the state's digital surveillance and information controls. Um, because access to the country is still so limited, media remains one of the primary means by which the regime manages and shapes its messages to audiences, both domestic and foreign. So we utilized it to get a baseline assessment of the country's current thinking and a scope for future calculations and intentions for the country developing its uh, and implementing certain digital technologies. And throughout this process, we established and held regular meetings with an advisory group to help scope out and guide research, um, offering invaluable feedback and reviewing our findings to make sure we had proper contextualization of the data and the analyses. Uh, all of these experts had experience working or um, studying closed societies, um, digital and surveillance technology and or North Korea as well. Martin, do you mind muting? I'm hearing an echo. Thanks. So in order to supplement our findings based on all this background research with what we could see in the media and academic publications, we also uh, interviewed 40 escapees in South Korea over the course of two research trips and conducted an in-country survey of 100 North Korean residents across 10 different provinces and major cities. Um, throughout our interactions with the escapees and current residents, we aimed for gender parity and sought individuals with varying ages and levels of education, different occupational backgrounds to try and get a broader sense of awareness and the literacy of digital security. Um, all of this data has been anonymized due to the sensitive nature of the discussions, but here we have a couple of infographics related to the interviews. Because of COVID border closures, we knew that our sample size and access to escapees um, and in-country residents would be limited, but it, it ended up being that 85% 80 of our interviewees actually left North Korea within five um, of leaving the country in 2022. So the average year of escape was 2017. So we thought that would be a pretty recent um, idea of what was going on in the country based on what we were also seeing in our uh, um, open source research. Uh, most of our interviewees reported living in border regions and also in major cities like Pyongyang. And we wanted to interview people, like I said, with different occupational experiences, some more in government or academia, others operating more in gray spaces who had illicit businesses. Um, we figured that some people in more official standing would have seen different kinds of technology, whereas others working in more illicit businesses in more rural settings might have encountered uh, different ways to use things like surveillance cameras or cell phone related information controls and surveillance. And we tried to interview people across a range of ages to see who might have been exposed to this technology. Uh, many of them ended up being in the age range of 25 to 44. And then moving on to our survey, based on previous success with our partner organization, the survey was conducted in person as well as via phone, messaging applications, and other forms of encrypted communication to ensure the safety of everyone participating from the survey managers to the respondents. Um, it was wholly dependent upon networks of individuals with connections to willing participants, as well as people who are trained to administer these kinds of questions. Uh, so that meant it had to be using a chain referral sampling methodology. Uh, the participants also spanned across North Korea, many from the, more of the center of the country, like South Pyongan and Pyongyang. Um, occupations were a little less specific, but many selected other when they were answering the survey, maybe because they weren't affiliated with an official workplace, they were conducting side businesses, or they were retired or were a dependent uh, without an occupation. We found that the age range and gender parity had also been similar to our interview sample size. So now that I've kind of given you the background of our methodology, I'm gonna hand it back to Martin to talk about our findings and things that surprised us. 
Uh, thank you, Natalia. Um, so I'm going to go into the, the findings in a moment, but sort of the big picture from all of this um, is that we found that digital technology, digital surveillance is slowly creeping into the lives of North Koreans, uh, but it's nowhere near the level that it is in China at the moment. And um, we've got some motivations on different types of surveillance. Uh, and also um, at the end, we'll be offering uh, some ideas why we think surveillance, digital surveillance hasn't gone all in at the moment. Um, so the first thing we started looking at was the sort of history of the, the research that North Korea has been doing into areas like biometric technology, which is one of the, the key technologies for, um, for digital surveillance. And the work that North Korea has been doing um, goes back uh, as far as the 1980s. Um, this, is, uh, this is a screen grab, a rather poor screen grab from uh, North Korean television in uh, 2001, showing uh, fingerprint recognition being developed at the Korea Computer Center. Uh, we don't have any images from earlier than this, but um, reports in state media uh, talked about both the Korea Computer Center and an organization called the uh, Amnot Gang Technology Development Corporation working on fingerprint technology in the 80s and 90s. Um, in the report, there's a few more details about this. Uh, the, the company, Amnot Gang, uh, even won some awards in uh, Switzerland uh, at an international show in the early 1990s for some of the fingerprint work that it had been doing. Um, and North Korea, back in this era as well, tried to sell some of these systems to law enforcement agencies. Um, in fact, some of the fingerprint work seemed to be going into basic security devices like door locks, and others seem to be going into uh, law enforcement use uh, where they would, um, rather than allowing access to something, be scanning the fingerprint to check it against the database. Um, so yeah, I think that shows that from early on, North Korea has not just been looking at this kind of technology, uh, but has also been eyeing it for security and for law enforcement purposes. Um, in the late 1990s, the fingerprint research was augmented with uh, voice and speech recognition work, and that went on for a few years. Uh, some of that was sold overseas as well. Um, and then it seems like things went quiet. Uh, there wasn't really any reports, at least in the media that we can see, of any additional work for uh, you know about five or 10 years. Uh, but things started to pick up in the mid 2010s. Uh, and, I, and that was with facial recognition technology. And I think two things were happening there. Computers were getting up and cheap enough that you didn't need to buy a massive mainframe or you know, a, a massive server to run the kind of software. Uh, but also there was more and more um, open source software that could be plugged in to develop your own applications. So facial recognition software is something that we're going to talk about in a minute as well. And that's something that was under development from about the uh, mid 2010s. Now, before we talk about uh, uh, you know, some of the, the technologies and things like that, um, uh, a recognition that also a lot of the work goes on at the State Academy of Sciences. Um, the State Academy of Sciences is charged with a lot of basic level research and development in North Korea, especially research and development that uh, goes after national priority areas. Uh, so I think that they were doing work on a lot of this biometric uh, research also shows that it was an important priority for the government. Uh, one of the things uh, also um, that we wanted to note here was, as we talk about the development of all these systems that collect biometrics, the state themselves has been collecting biometric data of its people. Um, most of the uh, best reporting on this has been done by Daily NK. Uh, they've had uh, more recent information out than we were able to get. Um, and uh, this is something that they published last year, one of the, the current North Korean um, digital ID cards. Uh, according to uh, the Daily NK, um, the, and, and you can see on this uh, card as well, that we've got the person's uh, blood type there, and apparently um, a blood test is taken for this. Um, there's also a photograph, so that gives facial recognition data. There's the basic information, obviously, about the person, their date of birth, and that kind of thing. And um, the reporting says that fingerprints are also taken. Uh, so if you look at this digital ID system um, you know, in, in whole across the entire country, there is the potential for a national level biometric database that has photos, um, DNA if the blood has been you know, taken properly and stored, uh, and also fingerprints. Um, in our research, we didn't find any evidence that a national level database has been created yet, uh, but 
I think moving from the old paper IDs onto these new, uh, much more sort of high tech IDs um, is a step towards the possibility of a national level biometric database. Uh, so into some of the findings um, on some of the technology. So one of the biggest ones was surveillance cameras. Um, surveillance cameras uh, really seem to have proliferated in about the last five years. Uh, when we talk to uh, some of our in-person uh, interviewees, the escapees that had come out, um, as Natalia said, around about 2017, a lot of people said they hadn't really seen many surveillance cameras. Uh, but when we did the in-country survey in 2023, um, half of all the people in that survey said that they saw uh, surveillance cameras all of the time. Um, now, of course, the, the two surveys are very small, um, so we're not, we're not sort of uh, obsessing over exact percentages and things like that. But I think going from a group that had barely seen these to going to a group that uh, almost half the people had seen them um, shows you that definitely surveillance cameras are getting more popular uh, and more common. And that's borne out in a lot of the stuff that we saw as well. Um, so for a lot of this, uh, we looked at state television. And one of the first places that we noticed widespread use of surveillance cameras was in school classrooms. Uh, this is a, a picture of a, a, a kindergarten, uh, you know, some young kids here. And you can see up on the wall in the back, there's a camera mounted. Um, the camera is pointing down. It looks to be on a sort of swivel base that can turn around and monitor different parts of the, um, of the classroom. Uh, and there's another camera. Um, in fact, if you watch North Korean state TV these days, Almost every time a school classroom is shown, especially if it's in a major city, um, you can probably spot a camera on the wall in the background. Uh, now, of course, you know, cameras are becoming more, um, uh, more common, uh, not just in North Korea, but in schools in different countries around the world. In some countries, there are big debates about uh, privacy and things like that. In other countries, not so much. Um, in many cases, the cameras are going into school classrooms for reasons of uh, things like child safety and uh, stuff like that. Um, North Korea does not appear to have a large problem with things like um, uh, things like theft from classrooms, with bullying, with that kind of thing, with with violence, with the same types of um, same levels of, uh, of issues that are forcing cameras into schools in the West. Um, so we think that these are probably much more to do with surveillance than to do with um, simple safety. Uh, and in fact, um, in, in some of the uh, state TV coverage, uh, we've been able to see, um, this is a, a monitor at a school, and um, you can see the feeds from all of the different classrooms up on there. Um, one of the reasons I think the, class, uh, the cameras are halfway down the classroom is that so the cameras can also face uh, the teacher. Uh, so they're not just about monitoring the students, but also about monitoring uh, the teacher, what the teacher is teaching, writing on the board, and what the teacher is telling um, the, the children in the classroom as well. Um, cameras are also widely deployed in workplaces. When North Korean TV goes to factories, there are always uh, people sitting in front of computers looking at cameras. Um, this, is, this is one of the fancier uh, sort of video walls that we've seen. Um, a lot of these cameras uh, seem to be much more about uh, watching the production process and monitoring machinery. Uh, but certainly some of these views are of uh, workers doing their jobs. And then sometimes we see cameras pointing into uh, areas where there's not machinery working, um, particularly, say, uh, pointing into store areas. Uh, so they might be there to, to stop people um, stealing things. Uh, and then also, um, this is another, uh, you know, we have to zoom in on these images. These are, these are cameras at a farm. Um, so they're just general cameras pointing out to uh, different, uh, different areas of the farm. I think in the bottom left is uh, maybe a storage area. Uh, you can see some people in front of it. And one of the sort of interesting things they're also monitoring with um, surveillance cameras is the uh, monuments and statues to make sure that uh, nothing untoward is done with those or in front of those. Um, so that's, uh, that's just a, a little bit about the spread of the surveillance cameras themselves um, inside buildings and inside workplaces and things like that. Uh, now, there is somewhere else where we see a lot more uh, cameras, and that's in road traffic surveillance. Um, this, is, uh, this is quite an old picture, I think, from the sort of mid-2010s. Um, it's a, a good resolution picture that the tourist took, and it shows this gantry of, of cameras in Pyongyang. Um, when this first came out, uh, we originally thought that these were all to do with red light monitoring and uh, taking photos of people that ran red lights. And in fact, people have told me that they've seen these, these lights uh, flash as if people drive through red lights. Um, the network has spread 
throughout Pyongyang. And the network has also spread now to other cities. Um, in 2014, we could see these at five intersections in Pyongyang. In 2019, they were at 42 intersections. And they were also starting to, to get into some other cities. Um, so this is definitely, uh, definitely spreading. Um, around the time of the pandemic, we started structures, these, these are the gantries that hold the cameras, in locations away from junctions. Uh, so, you know, nowhere near traffic lights. Um, we've got some examples here. This is, uh, this is on one of the highways. I believe this is the highway heading north out of Pyongyang. Um, and you can see from the shadow that this is not holding a road sign or anything like that. But um, this is, uh, we've got more pictures in the report. This is exactly what these things look like um, around all the traffic signals in Pyongyang. And this is uh, on the road down to uh, Nampo, I believe. Um, there's uh, a couple of these, one in each direction. Um, and there's another example. Uh, this is just south of Pyongyang on, on the um, highway coming up from Kaesong. Um, so we think what started as a, a sort of road safety, road traffic uh, monitoring system for red lights has probably expanded. And part of our belief for that doesn't just come from these structures, but also, as Natalia said, we've been looking through academic journals and uh, Kim Il-sung University has uh, been publishing data on license plate recognition software that they've been developing. Uh, one of their uh, systems that they developed um, said that uh, they could recognize a license plate with 96% accuracy in 20 milliseconds. So as these cameras expand, there's research going on as well for license plate recognition. Um, so, uh, you know, we suspect that these now are, uh, maybe they started off with simple red light running, but they're now becoming much more useful for the state and they're expanding into other areas. Uh, somewhere else where we've seen a lot of cameras um, is the border surveillance. Um, you know, these cameras didn't used to be there. They are now um, at many places along the border. If you, if you look across from China, um, we're getting our images from Chinese social media. Uh, the cameras, again, appear to be cameras that can move around. Um, uh, I think the, uh, the sort of idea is twofold here. It's not just to watch the border, but it's also, of course, to monitor the border guards. Um, and if the border guards don't know where the cameras are pointing, it's much more difficult for them to do things like accept bribes. Um, also worth noting that, you know, you can buy a doorbell to put on the front of your house for about $20, and it has software inside it that will tell you if it detects a person versus an animal. Um, we, of course, don't know the capabilities of any of these cameras. But the point is that the software is getting very cheap, that it can be installed in these things to give alerts when it's people and not animals. So it's, it's almost potentially um, a, a sort of digital monitoring of, of not just seeing what's going on, but actually monitoring people in the border area, um, especially if they approach riverbanks and things like that. Um, this, is, uh, this is another camera um, that, we, uh, that we pulled and we've got some more images in the, uh, in the report. But so far, um, you know, this is all surveillance cameras. And, and like I said, we don't know the actual capabilities of these. Maybe they're just providing a video view of something, um, which is, you know, a little bit more surveillance, but not so bad. Um, but we also started looking into digital facial recognition systems, which is, I think, where most surveillance, uh, video surveillance starts getting a little bit worrying in, in you know, any country around the world. Um, and uh, certainly uh, we found out that North Korea is doing a lot of research into facial recognition. Um, this is, uh, uh, we go into, uh, again, a lot more detail in the report, uh, but this is uh, from uh, Pudel Hanon Electronics, one of the North Korean electronic companies. And on the left there is a, a video surveillance system that they're talking about. Um, you can, you can uh, read all the details in the report. Uh, this was at the same exhibition, uh, which should have showed, um, showed them using the system. If you look closely, you'll notice that uh, all of the menus and things are in Korean. So uh, we believe this is either a software package or uh, a software package that was developed in, in North Korea. Uh, this is another one of their uh, systems, um, which shows the, uh, the video recognition. And if you look down in the bottom left, uh, they're also advertising uh, some of the, the car um, and vehicle recognition and um, systems like that. Uh, this is interesting. This is uh, from Kim Il-sung University. Uh, this is uh, an entrance gate that could be put in a, a building or something. Um, the entrance gate itself looks uh, fairly uh, more modern, fairly normal. Um, if you look closely on the right hand side, there's a sort of what looks a little bit like a smartphone on a, on a silver pole. 
And that is a facial recognition uh, terminal, which looks like that. Um, and Kim Il-sung University has talked quite a lot about the development of this uh, facial recognition system uh, that they've done. Uh, again, looking at this, we think the hardware is probably coming from overseas. That's probably a Chinese device, but the software appears to be all North Korean, or mostly North Korean. And then this is also um, the folks at Kim Il-sung University. Um, this is, again, a TV still from one of the exhibitions uh, that we had to zoom in on. Uh, but you can see that um, there's facial recognition going on there. The, the computer has identified the faces with the, the red box around them. And then on the uh, right hand side is the sort of matching, uh, I think the matching faces. Uh, so this is uh, the, the best we could, uh, the best image we could find of the actual facial recognition software. Um, uh, but again, uh, this is this is stuff that is is now existing in North Korea. And at least in the case of Port of Electronics, something that is being uh, so commercially sold to, to organizations and enterprises, not just a, a research and development project. Um, Talking about electronic surveillance, you know, just moving away from cameras for a moment, there were a couple of other areas. Um, I'm not going to go into all of them in the presentation. They're all in the report. Uh, but one of the other ones that we wanted to highlight was um, the growing use of electronic payments. Um, I think a lot of you know uh, that when the cell phones first came out, North Koreans were using cell phone credit as a kind of micro payment system. Um, the All of the reports from the country say that the cell phone micropayment system has been discontinued by the government. Uh, presumably it was something that they didn't have control over and they didn't have great insight into. Um, instead, however, there are at least two QR code based payment systems uh, being used in North Korea at the moment. Um, we uh, see them often in shops in Pyongyang uh, on state television. It was unclear how much these were being used outside the rest of the country. Um, but uh, just in, uh, you know, just as with some of our other research we were doing, uh, Daily NK uh, came to the rescue with a handy report last year um, that's, uh, that at least according to their correspondent, 60% um, of people in Pyongyang and 40% of people in the rest of the country were using QR code based payment systems. Uh, now, that's not obviously necessarily for every payment, but for some payments. Um, if those numbers are correct, then it's actually quite a very high usage. It's a lot more than I would have guessed. Um, the uh, interesting thing is that uh, the report said that most people are using them simply because they're easy. Uh, so people are not much about privacy here, but they're using them just because it's an easy way to, uh, to pay things. Uh, and then the other area I just wanted to um, uh, highlight uh, before um, we sort of uh, go back to Natalia and then to Q&A, was um, the sort of links with China, because we started talking about uh, all of the surveillance being done in China. Um, in general, what we've seen with technology in North Korea over the last few years has been that most of the hardware comes into North Korea from China. Uh, North Korea does not have great expertise in hardware design. So um, all of the cell phones, uh, the televisions, you know, the LCD TVs, the computers, all of that kind of stuff comes across the border from China. The software that goes into it, on the other hand, North Korea has much greater skills in software development than it does in hardware. So a lot of the software is locally developed. But the uh, the, the hardware, that's still relying on China. Um, we've got some, some uh, pictures in the report. Um, this was uh, this is from a 2018 IT fair. Uh, this is again, um, I think this was, yeah, this was Port of Hallen Electronics again, showing some of their cameras. Those two cameras up in the top, the, the large ones with the uh, on the sort of swivel bases, um, we tried to look into, we tried to look into all of these cameras. The smaller ones were too difficult because they look very generic, but the top ones look very distinctive. And um, it was easy to find that, um, you know, the one on the right is available at the moment on a Chinese e-commerce site. Uh, and the one on the left is the North Korean one. So um, there's a lot of evidence here. Um, also, um, NK News has done a lot of reporting um, with some of the surveillance cameras and matching them up with um, Hikvision, uh, the big Chinese surveillance company. So um, there's a, there's some reports that they've done too. So there's a lot of evidence here that while the, the hardware is all still coming across from China, um, there's a lot of software development going on in North Korea that we're seeing both in the media coverage, also in all of the scientific journals. Um, but as I said, you know, the surveillance society is not, uh, the digital surveillance society is nowhere near the same level it is in China. And uh, Natalia is going to talk about some of the reasons why we think that is. Thanks, Martin. 
So in synthesizing everything we learned from our research interviews and survey, yeah, we found some interesting trends in limiting factors of deployment of digital surveillance in North Korea. Um, overall, we found that the country is nowhere near where China is yet, as Martin mentioned, but it's definitely moving in that direction. And if you were to put yourself in Kim Jong-un's shoes, why wouldn't you want all of this technology to be deployed? Um, but we found that the speed's being governed by several factors. First is financial. Um, as Martin mentioned, the hardware is much cheaper than it used to be, um, but much of the technology and software still comes from China and requires foreign currency, which we all know North Korea is consistently and constantly working to acquire. Um, we also found the lack of electricity. It's not available consistently nationwide. Um, you can check out a 38 North report from 2013, uh, 2023, where we went into detail on North Korea's energy landscape um, for more information. But generally, it appears to be one of the reasons why technologies such as surveillance cameras have not been more widely deployed. Um, while some areas like Pyongyang and more industrial areas with a lot of factories are more consistently powered for necessity, um, some of our interviewees and surveys reported only getting a few hours of power a day or less. So it's still a big issue nationwide. Um, computer processing power and data connectivity is also a big issue. Um, in order to run a large network for facial recognition, for example, it requires data centers and strong network, both of which North Korea is moving toward but hasn't quite yet reached. Um, they have a national intranet, but it reportedly doesn't reach very deep into the country yet. Um, and in many areas, data connectivity by a cell phone doesn't have the capacity to, to support larger surveillance networks. Um, while there is a movement in the country toward 4G um, that'll help move communications along, it's still not quite there yet. And of course, um, North Korea always uh, already has a robust physical surveillance network that has been in place for decades. So while this does not hold back the deployment of digital systems necessarily, it does somewhat reduce the urgency of adopting digital platforms because their in-person surveillance is so effective. Uh, coming back to our interview and survey data, we also found that North Korean citizens and recent escapees know about of interacting with things like illicit content when utilizing digital technologies, but they're not always mindful of how these everyday technologies work um, both for and against them. So for example, um, over 80% of our surveyees were aware of surveillance technology. And as Martin said, almost half had seen a surveillance camera before. Um, however, 20% reported not knowing anything about surveillance technology. Um, not everyone in our interviews had encountered surveillance cameras when they were living there, but had heard about their use overseas. Um, some even attributed North, uh, South Korea's low crime rate to the widespread use of CCTVs. Um, and one quote that really resonated with us was, I don't know about surveillance technology, but I know it's working. But this is all to say that there's still a thirst for knowledge in North Korea to understand more about these technologies and how it's affecting them. Um, people also expressed a great interest in learning more about global affairs, foreign content, and digital surveillance overseas. Uh, many also expressed their wish for those outside of North Korea to better understand and learn more about the realities of their everyday lives. So all in all, we think our research and report highlighted a great need for information dissemination uh, in and out of the country to help raise awareness of the potential risks associated with surveillance technologies. There's also a need for greater digital literacy and guidance on how to safely utilize these technologies alongside consumption with uh, illicit foreign content and harsher punishments that we're seeing in reports from places like Daily NK. So with targeted education and access to these resources, we're hoping that North Korean citizens can make more informed decisions that can help shape their futures for the better. So thanks so much and boy, we look forward to answering your questions. I'm great.
Thanks, Martin and Natalia. That was a great summary of the report. And we do have some questions coming in. Um, again, to our audience, please feel free to type in questions into the Q&A box. Um, we welcome any level of questions, um, and especially for anyone who's less familiar with the information environment, if there's more basic questions that you want to ask, please feel free to do so. Um, I just want to touch a little bit on um, this idea of, of what you learned from the escapees in, in the interviews that you did. And certainly in most places in the world, um, we are familiar with um, and aware of the data collection capabilities beyond just CCTV cameras, um, but for all of the digital conveniences that you were talking about, like streaming services, credit cards, Metro cards, these kinds of things all have data collection capabilities. Um, and we know this because of external sources have told us this, not necessarily the companies themselves. Um, and we have a certain sense of trust in the companies that are collecting this information, um, despite all the leaks and breaches that happen <laughs> along the way. Um, but I wonder if you could tell us a little bit just about in the surveys that you did of the escapees, um, what was their awareness level beyond cameras um, of these of the data collection capabilities of these other conveniences? Um, and what kinds of things did they maybe underestimate or overestimate um, the data collection capabilities of? Martin, maybe we'll throw that to you first. Uh, yes. Um, I, overestimation was, was quite interesting. I think there's a, uh, actually, one of Natalia's favorite quotes was, uh, wasn't there something about a, uh, satellites and something like that and uh, uh, people uh, uh, satellites being able to watch what they're doing and I think it was something like uh, we've heard that the Americans have satellites that can like zoom in and read our cell phone screens or something like that so on the one hand we had some people that had this sort of fantastical idea that, that everything was being surveilled from satellites down to what was on their phone screens uh, and on the other hand uh, people saying things like why why would I care about cameras they help safety and they they don't beyond that um and i think that's one of the uh you know big big problems that uh or, or big issues with, with this is that this is deploying in north korea and north korea doesn't have a kind of watchdog media um and it is as you said the, the reason that we know about all of these practices of social media companies all of the ways that things are collected and we're tracked is not by the companies announcing it but by sort of whistleblower accounts in the media and, and those don't exist in North Korea. But I don't know, Natalia, do you remember anything? Yeah, like you said, a lot of people, based on the foreign media they had consumed, you know, from like action movies or dramas, had kind of that fantastical sense of, you know, satellites and drones are everywhere in South Korea and the US and they're spying on us, but not here. We're not utilizing like that, <laughs> utilizing it like that. So yeah, a lot of more fantastical understandings or just a blanket I, that doesn't apply to me. We don't have that over here. But then also, you know, have, when was the last time you actually read through all of your terms of service every time one of your application updates? Spoiler alert, most of us don't. So there's kind of that balance between realistically understanding how and why these technologies are being implemented and why they may, may require certain information, but also that implicit trust with these companies and governments to be a little transparent about why they're collecting this data and hoping that they're not selling it. But in North Korea, that's just not a widespread worry. It's not a widespread issue that they're interested in necessarily until it's directly impacting or affecting more on the economic side of their business practices. Um, you know, if they're caught, are they gonna be punished? Is it gonna affect their side hustles? That kind of stuff. Great, um, we do have one question that kind of takes it back to a little bit of the basics here. Um, the question is, is, what do you think are the major reasons behind such surveillance? Um, as mentioned, CCTV can help reduce the crime rate um, but what are some of the other reasons why um, the government would be instituting this level of surveillance going on in society? Yeah, I think it's um, I think it's re definitely reducing crime. Of course, the, the kind of crime that the government is looking at 
is not necessarily the same kind of crime that CCTV is targeted at in, in say, the US or Europe or somewhere like that. Um, you know, you've got to remember that in North Korea, um, giving somebody a USB stick might be regarded as a crime, depending on what's on the USB stick. So um, uh, definitely it's, it's, I think, partly related to that kind of thing. We see a lot of use of it in uh, building access. Uh, North Korean media says that there's facial recognition in use of um, the international airport and that it's being expanded to other government buildings and things like that. Um, so I think there's a security and tracking uh, applications. You know, like we say, it's not kind of China type national level tracking where somebody can go into a database if they want and find out everywhere that, you know, Jenny Tan went in the last week or something like that. We don't think North Korea is anywhere close to that. Um, but we think it's, it's, you know, that's what it's moving towards. Um, in the meantime, I think these are a lot of small little islands of security surveillance systems and tracking systems and things like that. Um, you know, for example, we talked about the digital ID cards. Uh, maybe there is a national database of all this, um, but you know, a lot of that is probably held at the provincial or the county level. Um, and if you want to go beyond that, maybe you know, it's, it's slightly, slightly more difficult, but things are moving in that direction. So I think what we're seeing is, is kind of little islands. Um, and if you think about the human surveillance that goes on, uh, that is targeted at crime reduction, but but also uh, you know monitoring what people are doing to stop people doing certain things. Um, the inmate band system that Natalia mentioned, uh, you know, will um, they'll come right into your house and look around your house and things like that. So there's certainly I didn't talk about it, but um, things like streaming TV services, which is something that does exist in North Korea now. Um, if you think about a streaming TV service, uh, you know, anyone that has Netflix or anything like that knows that as soon as you watch one thing, it gives you 20 similar videos because it's monitoring what you're doing. Um, in North Korea, uh, you know, the monitoring could be used uh, rather to give you more recommendations, but also to determine um, what you didn't watch. You know, Kim Jong-un's New Year's speech. Did, did you not watch it in your house? We, you know, they'll, they'll know if you've got a streaming box. They'll know. And if you didn't watch it, that could be a mark against you. You know, we don't have evidence of any of this, but simply knowing the way that the country operates and knowing what these systems are capable of, um, this seems something that isn't too far-fetched. Uh, you know, if it's not going on now, it's not too far-fetched to think it might be happening in the future. And, and sort of a related question here, um, there are anecdotal reports of state-owned enterprises, employees being paid um, with an amount to debit cards instead of cash uh, that can only be spent at state stores, not in the markets. Um, so with the appropriate software, this technology, could it be used to track household expenditures? What are your thoughts on this? Uh, I, think, I think definitely. Um, it depends, of course, on the, the types of cards and kind of how high tech they are. But any sort of debit card, if it's electronic, then you can technically track what's going on, even if it's not like a smartphone QR code thing. Um, it also depends on, you know, how much of the household um, expenses can be paid with a debit card. Perhaps only some places take debit cards and then cash is needed for other things and things like that. Um, but it would certainly be um, possible because, you know, that debit card at every transaction is having to reconcile with a computer somewhere that says, this is how much money is in this account. Um, and that is probably recording details about the merchant and the, the transaction amount and things like that. Um, you know, it's, I mean, that's possible in, in this country as well. It's possible in most countries around the world. So it's not, it's not um, unusual that uh, you could start tracking expenditures with that if you really wanted to. Great. Um, there's a number of questions here that talk about or that ask about um, in terms of of sources for the hardware um, for this technology. Is China the only external source of surveillance technology? What about Russia or Iran or other countries? Uh, in our research, we only saw Chinese uh, surveillance technology, uh, Chinese hardware. Um, of course, there's a lot of hardware that we couldn't identify. Um, that uh, screenshot that we had of the cameras on the wall, you know, they're all just kind of average looking cameras. So it's really difficult to determine who made them and where they come from. Um, but 
you know, China is on North Korea's border. It is the largest IT manufacturer in the world. A lot of the cameras that probably um, people are thinking about as Western cameras are actually Chinese cameras, but with just Western brand names on them. So, so much stuff comes from China. Um, I'd be I'd be really surprised if it was, uh, you know, if it was less than, say, 95 percent of the stuff was Chinese. And, and in fact, um, it's probably 100 percent or very close to 100 percent, because I think even even Russia, Iran, those types of nations, they probably all rely on, on Chinese um, OEM manufacturers as well, because it's, it's simple and cheap and easy to get stuff made in China. And if I can just jump in really quickly, we did look into um, the companies that attended trade fairs in Pyongyang, and they were overwhelmingly Chinese. I think there was some representation from Russian companies, but certainly most of what was advertised or pictures that were available, more of the text was related to the Chinese companies and their contributions as well. And are you aware of any of the sanctions that might apply to the hardware acquisition of any of these digital surveillance technologies? Uh, we didn't look into the sanctions side of things. Um, the report was mainly focused on whether this stuff was being in use in North Korea and being used against the North Korean people. So we didn't look into the, the kind of legal side or anything like that. And and I'm not an expert on sanctions, so I, I couldn't tell you if it even if they are against sanctions, I couldn't tell you what part of the sanctions they're against. Um, one of the questions, you know, is this idea of both of you as longtime North Korea watchers of North Korean technology developments and usage. Um, what are some of the findings in the report that you thought were most meaningful in terms of forecasting? What's what to look for, what we expect in the near future, near to midterm future? Yeah, I think um, a lot of what we looked into in terms of the interviews and the surveys were really helpful in completing the picture with what we were seeing, maybe a discrepancy between what we were seeing posted on state media and in the publications. Um, I think that there's a lot more interaction with digital technologies in people's everyday lives than is published about. And if you think about your own daily life, you do a lot of stuff that you kind of do automatically. You're not necessarily thinking about every single action you're doing every day that involves your cell phone or your laptop that has cameras and people being concerned that their phone is listening to them or who has access to listening in on phone calls or text messages and things like that. So I do think that some of the trends based on how people are thinking about technology in their everyday lives and how it impacts them, what they already know, and then even some of the misconceptions they have about technology is leading us toward this idea that it's proliferating pretty quickly. While it's certainly not at the level of what we're used to on everyday lives or what China is pushing out on their own digital surveillance in their own country. I do think that it is proliferating pretty quickly and we do need to be looking out for trends that are a little bit more worrying and preparing for that. Um, great. Uh, so there's, Martin, there's a lot of questions here about cell phones. Um, and and obviously you've done a lot of work in this area of what, what cell phone monitoring can and cannot do. Um, a lot of questions um, that are asking about, you know, is there microphones that can, you know, monitor um, live daily active um, conversations um, and, and how do cell phones then fit into this broader digital surveillance um, environment? Yeah. Um there were some questions about that because I forgot to say at the beginning that when we looked at digital surveillance we purposely didn't look at smartphone digital surveillance because we've done a lot of work on that already so we didn't just want to repeat that um, but in general uh, you know North Korea the North Korean authorities have the ability to listen to any phone call and monitor any data connection in the country um, this is not a unique North Korean thing uh, pretty much every telecom network in the world has something called a law, uh, a legal, legal, um, legal something gateway, legal eavesdropping gateway, or, or law enforcement gateway, or something like that. 
um, uh, where you know law enforcement is able to um, monitor communication. So North Korea has that. Um, we don't have any evidence in the North Korean smartphones that we've looked at uh, that there is any software on there that uh, allows the authorities to just come in and switch the microphone on and listen to what's going on. Um, of course, we don't know, you know, there are new phones now, maybe there is new software, but we've never found anything like that. Um, also, you know, going back to what Natalia was saying about some of the reasons why uh, some of this technology has been held back, up until the end of last year, North Korea um, just had a 3G cellular network. And, they, you know, most people are still on this 3G network. Um, that's not an awful lot of data speeds. Um, it's difficult, I think, for any of us to remember 3G speeds, unless you're like in the middle of nowhere in the countryside and your phone goes down to 3G. And then you're swearing and cussing at your phone because you can't do anything because it's so slow. So the network that North Korea is on at the moment also doesn't really allow for real-time uh, sort of monitoring of people, even, not even microphone, but even uh, position monitoring. We don't think the phones are reporting back GPS positions all the time and things, just because the cellular network just doesn't have the data capacity to do that. However, 4G is coming in and, and you know, 4G obviously a lot more capacity, 5G as well. Um, this will, these will be things that start to change some of uh, these capabilities, but um, we haven't seen any of that capability in any evidence of any of the software we've looked at. I laugh because I was uh, just in Mongolia recently and they're still on 3G. And so the how slow it actually was, was, was very frustrating. <laughs> Um, there are a number of questions here, and, and I think this might be outside the scope of the research that you did, um, but uh, asking about if there was any evidence that North Korea was exporting any of these digital surveillance technologies, especially the software that they're developing, and who might be likely targets um, for those exports? Would it be, for instance, in Africa or in the Middle East? Or, you know, what countries do you think would be interested in, in North Korean technology? Yeah, um, I mean, that's a good question. Again, yeah, a focus of our research because we were looking at internally in North Korea. But certainly, um, uh, you know, I mentioned, uh, like, for some of the early fingerprint work, uh, that was being actively promoted by North Korea around the world. Um, this was, you know, before sanctions in the in the late 90s and things like that. Um, uh, so North Korea was trying to do that. I think um, we've gotten the report, they even bid for a contract with, I think, the Egyptian National Police Agency. Um, we never, we couldn't find any information, any more information about it, apart from a, a sort of single mention somewhere in, uh, I think, a North Korean media report. Um, so I, I presume they didn't get it. But um, yeah, they, they used to be uh, pushing this stuff. These days, um, I think, yeah, I mean, supposing it's things like African countries also supposes that maybe the countries know where it's coming from. So it's going to be, uh, you know, your, um, uh, you know, more, more, more sort of parts of the developing world where North Korea has outposts and, and places like Iran or, or Russia or places like that. You know, one of the biggest issues these days is North Korean IT workers working for Western companies and Western companies not realizing they're employing North Koreans. So it is quite possible um, that there are some projects going on for Western companies maybe even big Western companies um, that are at some somewhere in the whole sort of software development process. You know, a little bit's been outsourced to some North Korean programmers online and the people who outsourced it thought they were giving it to programmers in China or in, you know, Thailand or somewhere like that. Um, so the possibility that a lot of this is going into other software. Um, but we didn't look at that and we didn't find any evidence of it now, but certainly in the past, um, you know, that was that was all being exported. And there's no reason to imagine that 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 wouldn't have changed. And, and certainly there, there are a growing number of stories of North Korean IT workers, especially um, and North Korean cyber surveillance uh, and cyber theft and cyber crime. They, they tend to be um, extremely uh, good at certain technologies um, and certain methods. Uh, and I think that often surprises people because they think of North Korea as a poor developing country um, and then find out that they do have um, a pretty sophisticated understanding of a number of different science and technologies. Um, one of the questions that came up and, and then Martin will throw it to you is 
is related to this of in terms of North Korean, you know, they recently hacked South Korean semiconductor companies to try and get chip designs um, and what factors might be prompt prompting this newfound need or desire. And what does this say about North Korea's current domestic semiconductor production out of Unjung? Yeah, so we don't know very much about the semiconductor production in North Korea. Um, for, I think, obvious reasons, it's it's something that the regime holds very close to itself because a lot of it is for uh, uh, military use and things like that. Um, it will, but I haven't uh, read in detail the reports about the South Korean hack, so um, I would be very interested to know what they were trying to get if it was just chip designs. And then also, if it was chip designs, at what geometry were the chip designs? Because... You know, you can you can steal a chip design for for you know the latest Intel processor, but you need very very specialized machinery to be able to build um, a, such a fine geometry. Um, so I don't know if North Korea was sort of stealing stuff um, to kind of help it uh, bring the basic level of its manufacturing up, or, or whether it was looking for actual designs that it would be able to possibly even copy into into its own um, into its own semiconductors. Um, so yeah, unfortunately not part of this report and I haven't looked in depth at that so uh, I'm not sure but it certainly is an area I think where um, at least in the defense field um, North Korea you know doesn't want to rely on other people to build semiconductors um, we see a lot of times when uh, you know missiles and things like that are picked up and people go through them and they find components from from all over the place obviously all of that stuff has to get smuggled in um, it's better if North Korea can build that themselves. Uh, it also enables them to, to sort of do some more custom designs. So I, I suspect that uh, for quite a few more years, the semiconductor industry in North Korea will be focused in that area. Um, commodity semiconductors for, for things like CCTV cameras or televisions and things like that. Um, I, I just don't think, you know, it's going to take too long to get up to those economies of scale. And those chips are so cheap, then it's a lot of time and effort working up to do that yourself where you can easily buy very cheap chips from, from across the border. Or if you're buying the hardware in general from China, then you don't need to manufacture your own chips. Um, and as a final question to you both, and I know you've given this some thought, um, there's a question, as, as mentioned in the presentation, although North Korea's utilization of digital technology is increasing, because of the state's lack of electricity capacity, effective human network surveillance already in place, um, there would not be that many needs for North Korea to increase this technology yet. Um, but despite this, and you know, despite the idea that this isn't as prevalent as it could be, um, do you think it's time to start talking about how to increase awareness of the risks of digital technology in North Korea to North Koreans, or is it too early to worry about this? So I, I pose this to both of you. I'd love to get your thoughts on it. Yeah, I mean, I would gently push back and say I don't think it's ever too early to start preparing. Um, just thinking in your own day to day usage, you want to have as much information as possible. You want companies to be as transparent with you as possible, and you want to make sure you're utilizing your digital technology safely. You don't want to put yourself in a situation where you are getting hacked or your information is getting sold or you're on camera doing something you shouldn't be doing, anything like that. So in order to make sure that people are just living their daily lives safely, we feel that it's very important to make sure that the flow of information in and outside of North Korea is still available and accessible to make sure that people are being as safe and as hygienic with their digital technology as possible. Martin, did you want to add anything to that? Um, no, I think, I think Natalia summed it up great. Great. Um, well, that is actually the end of our time. Um, as I mentioned, the report is now online at 38 North, as well as on the Stimson website. Um, there will be a Korean language version that will come out at the end of the month, um, and we'll be sure to um, distribute that uh, when it is available. Um, but I want to thank both uh, Martin and Natalia for walking us through the report um, and for all the hard work that you've done on this over the past two years. 
Um, I, I think it's a very valuable contribution to our own understanding of how North Korea's information and social controls are evolving in society. Um, and with that, I want to thank the audience for joining us today, and I hope you will join us for events in the future.